Okay, we'll get going. So uh, welcome to the webinar, Ecocide and the Rights of Nature. Uh, this is part of the Ecological Law and Governance webinar series, uh, which is an initiative of the Ecological Law and Governance Association in partnership with various environmental groups. And today's event is hosted specifically by Earth Law Center. Uh, if you don't know us already, we're a network of legal professionals advocating for the rights of nature and other ecocentric legal movements, including Ecocide, both in the United States and increasingly all over the world. Uh, now, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping things. Uh, I mentioned this is being recorded. Uh, if you weren't here when I said that, now you know, so keep your video off if you uh, don't want to be recorded. Uh, all your microphones are <clears throat> muted already, and keep them that way unless you uh, want to ask a question at the end, which I'll talk about in a second, or have any breaking news about Ecocide that must be shared. <coughs> and uh, we'll have some Q&A at the end. The best thing to do for that is to type your questions in the chat box, and then uh, at the end, I'll ask the questions as a moderator to the panelists. And that's all the housekeeping stuff. Uh, so today we're going to hear from experts on ecocide and ecocentric law more generally. And uh, I know rights of nature is in the title of the webinar. Uh, today's focus will primarily be on ecocide. Uh, but at the end of the webinar, to the extent it hasn't been discussed already, uh, I will tie things up by talking about how the legal movement to recognize ecocide as a crime and the legal movement to recognize uh, rights of nature uh, can, can support each other. Uh, after all, ending ecocide and recognizing the rights of nature are both crucial elements of the evolution of our legal system towards ecological based laws, uh, which I refer to as earth law. And that is what we will talk about today. Uh, of course, I have to cough horribly as soon as this webinar starts. Uh, so let me begin by introducing our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker is Herman Green. Uh, and Herman Green is the president of the Center for Ecozoic uh, Societies in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And he serves on the board of uh, many uh, ecological based environmental groups. And Herman, I, uh, I'm not sure if all these are up to date, but I'll note, uh, in my opinion, the most important one, he's a board member on uh, the board of Earth Law Center, and is also the uh, one of the editors of our forthcoming book, uh, Earth Law Emergent Ecocentric Law, a Practitioner's Guide. Uh, being released by Walters Kluwer later this year. Uh, he holds a graduate degrees in spirituality and sustainability, uh, United Theological Seminary uh, in 2004, and also a degree in law from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in 1979, uh, and a degree from the University of Chicago Divinity School in 1970, and another in political science from Stanford University in 1967. Uh, so we're very honored to have Herman here to kick things off, and uh, I'll pass it over to you, Herman. Uh, go ahead and uh, share your screen. He's got some slides along with his uh, presentation, and um, then after Herman's done, I'll introduce the next speaker. So thank you, Herman. Thank you, Grant. Um, let me get to the first slide. So uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I see some familiar names on the screen. And so hello to all of those you have met in the past. Um, this is, um, my presentation will be on the history of ecocentric law. And then Anastasia will be pre presenting on, on current state of ecozoic, of, um, of ecocide. And Jojo will talk about uh, the cutting edge in this field and she's been the one who's been most involved in this of the three of us so i'm i'm looking forward to all these presentations <clears throat> so i call this earth law in action and what we will cover is environmental law and why it fails earth law the history of ecocide the rome statute and wartime ecocide and ongoing ecocide efforts. Let's see. Um, I think I'm not showing the slideshow, so let me see if I can get that. Okay. All right. So environmental law and why it fails. <clears throat> so environmental laws is as old as 
history, where there's always been issues about how to relate to the natural world. The Hebrew scriptures are full of that. Uh, Roman law, all the laws, um, customary law of indigenous people, everyone had to deal with issues relating to their environment and issues of pollution. Some of the great civilizations have suffered greatly from environmental degradation. That's not new. What's new is that it's a global phenomenon. So what led to our current environmental law were the effects of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, there's a couple of authors that said that the only real evolution, uh, revolution in the modern period was the Industrial Revolution, and certainly it is the most, uh, has had the greatest impact. So there's been these things with increasing uh, populations and industrialization, like in 1858, the great stink on the Thames River where sewers were flowing into the river and they had to close Parliament. And that led to the London sewerage system and there's been many other breakdowns like that um, along the way. 1970 is symbolically the beginning of the distinct period of modern environmental law. In that year, we had Earth Day, in which 20 million Americans presented uh, were present. That's one out of every 10 Americans. U.S. Envi National Environmental Policy Act was uh, passed and the EPA was established and this took place not only here, but around the world. In 1972, the United Nations held its first global conference on the environment in Stockholm. So environmental law attempts to remediate the negative side effects of industrial development without challenging the development uh, paradigm. Over these last 70 years, the um, uh, the situation has changed quite a bit. The population was 3.2 billion. It's hard to believe 3.2 billion in 1970. Today, it's almost 8 billion. Um, as you know, all these things have changed dramatically. So the human impact on Earth is orders of magnitude greater than anticipated. The scope and scale of the issues have vastly increased knowledge of ecology, biology, geology, evolutionary dynamics, earth systems is broader and deeper, and perspectives on the nature-culture divide have changed. Humans are seen as a part of nature and yet also as the exceptional agents within nature. Knowledge of sentience and consciousness and non-human animals has grown, Awareness of ecological limits, tipping points, and the potential for irreversible decline and catastrophic state shifts in Earth's functions have been, been known. Climate change has emerged as a primary environmental concern, and issues of North-South relations and global inequities have come to the fore. Why environmental law? So despite all the uh, thousands of environmental laws, and I read recently there's over 2,000 international treaties uh, concerning the environment, and it has been effective in many ways, and yet the, um, the peril is greater than it was in 1970 to the overall Earth system. So environmental law and the policy has focused on localized efforts and not systemic change. It doesn't challenge the development model. And it's based on an orientation of separation. Humans are separate from nature. And in the modern period, the task is to control and elevate nature. We focused on possessive individualism and utilitarian science of how to get things done. But the problems today are systemic. Things like climate change, desertification, deforestation, ocean acidification, habitat uh, fragmentation, loss of biodiversity, and other things. So earth law. Earth law is an emerging body of law for protecting. I have to say part of my screen is covered, so. <laughs> I, um, I'll have to guess at what's on the ad side. Protecting, restoring, and stabilizing the functional interdependencies of Earth's life and life support systems 
at the local, regional, bioregional, national, and global levels. Earth law may be expressed in constitutional, statutory, common law, customary law, as well as in treaties and other agreements. So there are other names that people use uh, for earth law. Some call it earth jurisprudence. Uh, some call it wild law. And there are other terms that are in use, but they have the same general concept. So as opposed to the orientation of separation, where humans are seen as separate from nature, earth law is based on an orientation of connection, entanglement, and mutuality. So I like the word entanglement because um, it's not really that we can pick out problems and solve them. We're entangled in the earth system and there's a need for mutual action um, in a consciousness of or a connection for us to go forward. The field of earth law, including ecocide, is, um, will be developed in practice. It's not an established body of law. In fact, if you wanted to pick out a textbook on earth law, you'd have to read the one that we're writing. And I hope that it will be a, a significant contribution. I've worked with Grant Wilson and Tony Zell and Rochelle um, Adam and probably 20 other authors in developing this textbook. And I, it will be, uh, I, I, there are other things that have been published, but this is the first in the nature of a textbook for law students. So the earth, earth law includes such fields as the public trust doctrine. This is the idea that a primary uh, responsibility of the sovereign is to protect the natural resource base on which human life depends. And many of you are familiar with the atmospheric trust litigation like our children's trust, where they're arguing that the federal government has failed in taking care of the needs of future generations by not caring for the environment, despite knowing for over 30 years what the problems are. The rights of nature is another um, uh, set of ideas the rights of future generations, human environmental rights, ecocentric governance, and ecocide, which is our topic today. So ecocide is based uh, on the idea that Earth cannot survive in pieces. It's a self-regulating organic unity. The first time I heard the term, and it's not in this particular quote, but uh, it, it has been used by Thomas Berry. But the first time I really began to think about this was um, in reading the great work by Thomas Berry. When he said that um, we find ourselves ethically destitute just when, for the first time, we are faced with ultimacy, the irreversible closing down of Earth's functioning in its major life systems. Our ethical traditions know how to deal with suicide, homicide, and genocide, but these traditions collapse entirely when confronted with biocide, the extinction of the vulnerable systems of the Earth, and geocide, the devastation of the Earth itself. So a way of thinking about ecocide is it's a crime dealing exactly with a combination of biocide and geocide. So ecocide refers to the destruction of ecosystems and the species they support on a massive scale. The reasons for the move, to, and I would like to point out that this is a, this is a criminal is developed as a criminal offense, just like um, genocide is a criminal offense. The reasons for the move to criminalize ecocide is um, that incremental, incremental measures, such as identi identifying specific toxins and chemicals and regulating their use fails to address the magnitude 
of environmental degradation that is occurring. An ecocide like genocide is of international concern and should be subject to transborder enforcement. So for example, <clears throat> last summer, many of you are aware of the uh, burning of the forest and uh, actually it was winter there, but it was the burning of the forest in the Amazon. <clears throat> and there was international attention to it. The uh, group of seven uh, discussed it during their hearings. But the traditional rules of sovereignty and property would not allow intervention if you're dealing with your own property, if you're dealing with your own state. So this is the reason that there's a need to uh, identify it as a crime, which it would not be under traditional doctrines. Excuse me, there we go. The term ecocide was first used to describe Operation Ranch Hand, which was the name of an operation during the Vietnam War, where there was a spraying of 20 million gallons of Agent Orange over an area the size of Massachusetts. Um, and in the writing of some of the scientists at that time, they first used the term ecocide. War crimes up to that point concerned the mistreatment of humans, not nature. This changed in 1976, and this was a, uh, a result of the uh, Vietnam War, when the UN General Assembly approved a resolution on the prohibition of military or any other hostile, um, and there's a word I'm missing, but of environmental modification techniques. More significantly, in 2002, the Statute of Rome uh, came into existence, and that was when the International Criminal Court came into being. This is the primary instrument for international crimes. It made wartime ecocide a crime. So here's what the Rome Statute says about wartime ecocide. It lists, it does not use the term ecocide, but it lists uh, specific war crimes. So this is the section of the statute dealing with war crimes. And the, the subsection B just says that means actions of the following type. So the one that deals with ecocide is intentionally launching an attack in the knowledge that such attack will cause incidental loss of life or injury to civilians or damage civilian objects or, and this is where the ecocide comes in, or widespread long-term and severe damage to the natural environment. And yet look at the qualification, which would be clearly excessive in relation to the concrete and direct overall military advantage anticipated. There is still no international crime of peacetime ecocide, and our other speakers will be discussing that. Further, the Treaty of Rome only penalizes natural persons, um, and as yet, no ecocide case has been brought under that statute. Since the um, issue of ecocide was raised after the Vietnam War, and especially uh, beginning in the 1990s and later, there's been a very significant literature developed on the crime of ecocide. And Polly Higgins and Jojo, who is on our seminar today, have been um, the international leaders in this effort. Uh, at least 12 nation states do have ecocide laws. Let's think where ecocide may come into play. Remember, we're talking about systemic damage. Deforestation is a massive, um, uh, we talked about how ecocide is a massive destruction of the environment. So deforestation, dead zones, 
the development of tar sand petroleum and the damage that does to the areas where it's being done. Oil spills such as the Deepwater Horizon and greenhouse gas emissions. And now I will turn it to Anastasia. Great, thanks Herman. This is Grant. Um, I'll give Anastasia a, a quick introduction and then uh, pass it off to her. Um, so uh, yeah, now we learned about uh, ecocentric law, uh, what we call earth law in specific and got an introduction to ecocide. And um, now Anastasia Green uh, will dive in deeper. And Anastasia Green is an immigration clinical fellow with the Intimate Partner Violence Assistance Clinic at the Levin College of Law in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, she previously served as the supervising attorney at John Marshall Law School's Pro Bono Clinic, uh, where she taught seminars on foreclosure law, transgender law, and litigation practices. Uh, Green has focused her legal career in the public interest sector and has worked as an attorney representing low-income clients with legal aid agencies. Uh, she recently published an excellent law review article in the Fordham Environmental Law Journal on Ecocide, uh, which is available on the Ecological Law and Governance Association website. Uh, Green earned a JD at Washington and Lee University School of Law and a BA at Westminster College. So everyone welcome Anastasia and I will uh, pass it off to you. Oh, looks like she got dropped and is coming back in right now. Hi Anastasia, can you hear me? see here. All right, everyone refill your coffee cups. Okay, there we go. Anastasia, do you hear me? I do, yes. Hi, okay, I just uh, introduced you and you, looks like you got dropped, <laughs> but came back in. So, yes, uh, yeah, I lost my internet. You and... Thank you, uh, yeah, I lost my internet connection, but I was able to get back in, okay. Um, okay, I just made you a co-host again, and I'll, uh, let's see, looks like you got your Video going, so there you are. Okay, it's all you. Thank you, Anastasia. Okay, uh, thank you. And please let me know if anybody can't hear me or has any trouble with, with that, okay? Um, so I just wanted to talk today a little bit about the law of ecocide as it exists right now, or, or does it exist right now, um, and how that's being implemented in different countries um, and internationally as well. So um, where uh, uh, Dr. Mr. Green end, ended up uh, was talking about the Rome Statute um, and when the Rome Statute was actually implemented with the ICC. So there was originally some talk at that period of time of having ecocide included in the Rome Statute. It, it ultimately ended up being taken out of the Rome Statute when that was passed. Um, but that for quite a bit of time there, it was in the statute. There was a draft called Article 26, which is actually a draft article for um, ecocide. This was in the 90s before the Rome Statute got passed. Um, and one of the other things that happened during that period of time was the breakup of the USSR. Um, and a lot of these countries ended up using that, you know, proposed ecocide uh, that was proposed to the ICC as a basis for their own national laws. So there are right now um, at least 11 countries that do currently have a law against ecocide, a law criminalizing ecocide. Um, and I think that's really, you know, helpful to note because it shows that ecocide is not really that uh, abstract. It's not that difficult. It's not something that's like impossible to implement because many of these other countries have. Um, the first country in the world that actually passed the law of ecocide was Vietnam. Uh, and Vietnam, you know, had quite a history in this. Uh, the actual, even when you talked about the history of, of, of the term, a lot of that actually sprang up during the Vietnam War in terms of the use of Agent Orange, in terms of the destruction of land, um, destruction of, of the, you know, the actual farms that would be feeding people. And that's the term of ecocide. Um, when Vietnam in 1990 uh, actually passed their own law for ecocide, the, the first law ever uh, of any country that's criminalizing ecocide. Uh, and the law in Vietnam stated, it's in the criminal code, uh, ecocide is the destruction of the national environment, whether in times of peace or war, constitutes a crime against humanity. So, oh, I think I stopped. Oh, sorry. This is Grant. I turned off your video because your audio was a bit choppy, so I thought that might help it. So apologies. Is it is it any better now? I can hear. Uh, 
Okay, everyone else heard fine. It could have been my end. Okay. Yeah, please let me know if there's any um, issue. Or you can do that in the chat as well. I have the chat up as well. I haven't okay, had a problem can... hearing. Oh, totally my fault. Pardon the interruption. Keep going. No, Thank you. No internet issues. Um, okay. So that was passed in 1990. Um, then the former republics of the USSR, so I said like the USSR actually broke up the fall of the USSR in 1990. And so a lot of these former republics were actually looking for a model for their new laws for the first time ever they would have their own criminal code. And many of them looked to the Rome Statute, looked to those earlier drafts of the Rome Statute and to try to formulate their own crime. Um, and so there is uh, 10 former USSR republics that currently have a law against ecocide. Uh, many of these used as a model, the Article 26 that was removed from the Rome Statute uh, and that the language of that article said that an individual who willfully causes or orders the, ca the causing of widespread long-term and severe damage to natural environment shall in conviction thereof be sentenced. Uh, so that was the model that many of these countries used. Right now, um, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Georgia, Armenia, Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, and Russia itself have actually a statute in the criminal code against ecocide. Um, and all of these statutes are very similar. They, they have almost near the exact same language. Um, the language of these statutes states that, quote, massive destruction of the fauna and flora, poisoning of the atmosphere or water resources, as well as other acts capable of causing an ecological catastrophe constitutes a crime against the peace and security of mankind. So you can see how even though these are national laws, they are sort of mirroring that same language in terms of what would be considered a crime against humanity. Um, or when they talk about genocide, they're, they're sort of mirroring that same type of language. Um, and these were mostly passed in the early 90s. The last one that passed the law was in Belarus uh, in 2002, and they all are the same type of language. So I um, looked into this bit as well, these, well, these laws are in the books, are they being used or what's happening when they try to use them? Um, the law in Vietnam has been used um, and is being implemented. Uh, they, this is, someone asked, is this only in wartime conditions? No, this is in peacetime or wartime. So the law in Vietnam specifically says whether in times of peace or war uh, shall constitute a crime against humanity. And in the, um, the former republics as well, it's a simply massive destruction uh, is a crime against the peace and security of mankind. It does not require that the, there be an actual war or a war crime. Um, and so how has this been implemented? If you look into it, it's quite surprising that some of the, maybe it shouldn't be surprising, but some of these the former um, republics that have actually a very strong uh, law of the environment um, and a lot of um, sort of strong advocates in the environment. So in Kyrgyzstan, for example, which is where they have that law in the books, um, I looked into how has that been used and it has been used and they have been a number of prosecutions under this. The problem tends to be getting convictions. So for example, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, they brought charges against an, uh, a company, a Kyrgyzstan company, that ended, was actually importing, um, contaminating the coal with radioactive waste and shipping them to the schools and the hospitals all over the country, and they were actually radioactive. Uh, and so they prosecuted the head of the company, they prosecuted a government official that was involved in that as well, uh, and it was a major case at the time. They ended up not getting a conviction, potentially due to the level of influence that that government official had. That government official ended up rising in, you know, to become a, a vice president later on. But it can happen. It does happen. So this isn't pie in the sky. You know, it's something that can be used right now. Um, and if you go around the world, what are the countries, what are the areas, is there now a law of ecocide or are they getting to be a law of ecocide? A lot of what you see with ecocide is that it's not necessarily law yet but it's sort of bubbling up, it's becoming law. It's on that, that cusp of actually being enacted. So a lot of what you'll see is this sort of like bubbling up, boiling up of these different sort of advocacy efforts until finally it gets passed and gets used. Um, Latin America, uh, South America, Central America has actually been very active as well in creating laws against ecocide. Um, so most of these laws, however, do not specifically call it ecocide. They use different terms. So. Um, in Ecuador, actually created a provision for what they called um, legally enforceable laws of rights of nature. Um, and that uh, was actually put into a constitutional provision. So in the Constitution of Ecuador right now, there is a constitutional provision that gives legally enforceable rights to nature itself. So 
if something is violating the rights of nature, that's a cause of action. That's something that you can sue somebody for um, on behalf of nature itself. And the term for this was Pachamama, and it goes back to actually indigenous culture of the concept of having the, the earth as a being or the earth as something with its own rights. Um, Bolivia now has two national laws that create what are called na nature's rights. So if na nature rights are violated, that can be a criminal uh, provision and that can also be a civil violation. Um, and th so these are ecocentric provisions, right, as opposed to anthropocentric provisions that are about, you know, what happens to us as human beings. This is about what happens to the earth and creating civil and criminal penalties based on that. Um, Guatemala, uh, you know, they, they were very, uh, had a major push. This is about three years ago. They uh, created a law, a civil law for environmental um, damage or ecological damage, destruction of ecosystems, very similar to what would be a law of ecocide. They created it at their own national court as well. So this is a separate environmental court just for uh, violation of, of, of environmental law or violations of the rights of nature. Um, so I looked into that as well. So how is that being implemented, for example, in Guatemala? Um, and a, a case example is that there was a palm oil uh, company that was just dumping massive amounts of toxic chemicals into the river that the factory was located next to and killing all the fish, all the wildlife, all of the flora and fauna in, in that river. And it turned out to be that downstream, there were of course many um, communities, many villages, many indigenous tribes that were relying upon that river to fish and to survive. Um, so they brought the case and it was brought into the environmental court. Um, and there was a victory. So they actually won at first. They won and they, a judge issued an order that ordered the plant to be shut down uh, until they stopped poisoning the river. So it was an injunction uh, to actually shut down that plant. There was also a, um, a damages victory. Problem being, later on, uh, one of the activists was actually murdered. And then later on after that, the injunction got removed. So what I think you can see sometimes in the national laws is where there are these, there, there are very strong national laws, but the problem is sometimes that these are very powerful actors sometimes that you're going, on, going after. And if it's based on just a country, one specific country, that's where corruption or poverty or other issues can make it difficult to enforce some of those laws. Um, okay. And so that's the countries that currently have a law where there's an actual criminal law in the books, right? So, so what is happening beyond that um, in terms of the national laws? There's been a lot of advocacy in um, the UK. So the UK is a, a major center right now in a lot of ways for this emerging law of ecocide and for emerging action on that. Um, Polly Higgins was uh, the one who actually sort of spearheaded a lot of these efforts. She introduced the provision to the ICC to create a law of ecocide again before the ICC in 2010. Um, they also created a model law. So um, that Polly Higgins organization created an actual model law for the UK that could be implemented nationally as well. There's been a lot of petitions. There's been a lot of demonstrations in the UK itself regarding getting the UK to implement a national law against ecocide. Um, it has also made its way into some of the Green Party platforms. In the EU, um, it, it made it into the platform of the Green Party to... The EU Green Party had a draft resolution to implement a, a law of ecocide in the EU. And they, in the 2014, they were submitted to the UK Parliament 170,000 signatures asking for a law against ecocide. Um, in the US, what's happening with ecocide? Is there a law against ecocide in the US? No. Is there anything on the horizon for a law against ecocide in the US nationally? No. Are there any states in the US that have a law against ecocide? No. However, there are a number of, if you go down another level, local municipalities, these are cities and um, counties and towns. Many of these municipalities have actually implemented and created their own ordinances against ecocide or against environmental destruction. Um, so there's 36 municipalities now within the United States that have actually passed provisions, ordinances against what would be considered ecocide, against environmental destruction or um, ecosystem destruction. And so these actually create um, enforceable laws, enforceable rights for natural communities and for ecosystems to exist and flourish. 
So, for example, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania has an ordinance to this effect that creates enforceable rights of nature. Uh, Santa Monica, California has a, a, a law for enforceable rights of nature. Some of these will be now not necessarily for covering ecocide as a whole. A lot of them will be specifically for water, for example. So if there is um, misuse of the water, misuse of the water resources, that is actually a, a criminal violation. Um, so for example, in Santa Monica, the ordinance is right for an aquifer to be, to be healthy. So it's not as an anthropomorphic, right? Anthrocentric, it's an ecocentric, the right of the aquifer itself to be healthy. And therefore, if, if there's misuse of that aquifer, um, or there's poisoning or contamination, then that can actually be a criminal provision. So there is a lot of um, activism there on the local front, national front. So we've got national laws that are in the books, right? You have a lot of advocacy for to create these in other areas as well, in other um, countries. Um, and I just wanted to, to talk just a little bit about what's happening internationally. Um, I think Dr. Green finished with the, the actual Rome Statute itself when that was enacted. So Rome Statute itself, you know, we have the four core crimes against humanity, uh, which are war crimes, um, or crimes against peace, they're called. You have actual war crimes, you have uh, crimes against humanity as well, um, and a genocide, and gosh, I've forgotten the last one. I'm sorry. But they have those four core crimes. There's a lot of advocacy now at this point internationally to include ecocide as what's called a fifth crime against peace. So this would be a new provision that would be actually be put into the Rome Statute that would make ecocide itself an internationally crime. And you could see why this would be very appealing to a lot of people because it would avoid some of those issues I was mentioning on the national front, like uh, you, the Amazon, massive destruction of the Amazon, supported by the Brazilian president, right? So you're not going to have much success on a local level or on a, even a national level probably there. Whereas if you could go to the ICC itself, then that person or that president, that leader could be held actually criminally accountable. Um, so in 2010, is when the first provision was introduced to the ICC, that was by Polly Higgins uh, in April of 2010. This was a provision to actually create the fifth provision, uh, the fifth what's called crime against peace for ecocide. And the language of that statute was that, the, the language of that provision was it would be quote, the extensive destruction, damage to or loss of an ecosystem of a given territory, whether by human agency or by other causes, to such an extent that peaceful enjoyment by the inhabitants of that territory has been severely diminished. This is totally ecocentric. So the inhabitants, meaning not the people necessarily that live there, but the, the animals that live there, the fish that live there, anything that is destroy, destroying the ecosystem for those inhabitants can be considered uh, ecocide. Crimes of aggression, thank you, that's the, that's the fourth crime. Um, okay, so that was submitted in 2010. There was not action necessarily at that point on that. It has not been formally introduced. However, it's bubbling, it's getting there. And there's been increasing advocacy on this issue. So 2016, the uh, ICC Office of the Prosecutor released a policy paper. Um, this is the only policy paper that the prosecutor has released in terms of case selection about what types of cases will be you know, prosecuted, what types of cases they will be taking. And in this case, in this policy paper, the prosecutor stated that she will be taking into account environmental destruction as a major factor when it comes to actually bringing cases before the International Criminal Court. So this is going to be taken into account in two different ways. When it comes, you know, they're supposed to be taking uh, the most grave cases. So you have to consider the gravity of, of the, what the destruction has been. So under this policy paper, they can also consider the destruction to the environment, damage to the environment when assessing the gravity of that crime. Um, you also, they're also supposed to be considering the impact or what would be the impact on, on the people or the country or um, regarding that crime. And now with this new provision, with this new policy paper, you can, the prosecutor will also take into account the environmental impact as a new uh, factor that can be considered. So this means that when they're considering what types of cases to take under those four crimes, right, we have aggression, crimes against humanity, et cetera, that they will be taking into account the environmental destruction as a major factor when it comes to case selection. So it, it almost, some, there was some argument at the time that, well, does this mean that there's now a lot of ecocide by the back door in a way, you know, because now we can just bring these sort of environmental crimes. The problem is, is that Yes, you can consider the environmental damage when it comes to the gravity, when it comes to the impact, but you still got to get it in one of those four categories. Crimes against humanity, war crimes, crime of aggression, you know, you, you, 
a genocide, it has to meet one of those categories. Um, so it makes it, but it, it makes it difficult to just bring a case, for example, like the Amazon rainforest, it makes it difficult to try to bring that type of case. But it does mean that when it comes to, for example, a war crime, crime against humanity, they're going to be considering how this is damaging the environment. They're going to be considering, for example, forced evictions um, where farmers are being removed from property or um, entire populations, indigenous populations are removed from property is now a factor that's considered by the ICC prosecutor when it comes to bringing these crimes, um, when it comes to prosecuting. So it's bubbling. And there, and, yes. Um, the, the section I mentioned is a war crime and that's still on the books, but not the separate, the separate crime of ecocide. Yeah, so the, the war crimes is still on the books. It's a very difficult standard to meet in terms of the war crime provision for um, environmental damage, if I remember correctly. It, it's, it has to be widespread, long-term, and severe, and beyond the actual objectives of that, of that war. So uh, under that standard, you could see even, for example, like where they um, burned the oil fields in Kuwait, for example, you could, there, there could be an argument, well, that was our objective at the time, and it was meeting our war objective, therefore it was okay. So I don't, I, from what I remember, and I, I believe this is still correct, I don't think there's been a single prosecution under that provision of the war crimes. Um, that, so because it is such a difficult um, standard to meet. So yeah, and then the Article 26, which would be the separate one just for ecocide, ended up not passing, not being included in the final draft of the, of the Rome Statute. Um, so what's happened most lately is that this is a, a ball that seems to be a, a gaining speed um, in terms of whether this is going to be implemented. Um, most recently, um, there has been a lot of meetings with uh, Vanuatu, uh, with a country that's part of the ICC. It's a Pacific Island uh, country that's going to be very, very um, subject to environmental damage from climate change, from rising sea levels. They've been very active on this front. One of the reasons why the ICC is such an appealing forum is that you only need one country to introduce the amendment, right? So it's not like the UN where you have the security resolutions, you have the, the, the major countries sort of controlling a lot of what's happening. With the ICC, any country can introduce the amendment and then the state parties just have to take a vote on that. So Vanuatu has been making a lot of indications that they will be um, possibly raising this as an amendment. Um, the next state party will be meeting in December of this year. Even this year, they may be uh, introducing that as an, as an amendment. So uh, Vanuatu actually had called for at the last me ICC meeting in December 2019, called for an ICC ecocide provision specifically. Uh, the ambassador for, for Vanuatu said that the court shall um, should amend the uh, Rome statute to quote, criminalize, um, to criminalize actions that amount to ecocide. And they've also got support from the Maldives, which is another country, you know, Pacific Island uh, country, that is also supporting this, um, this advocacy. And the um, member of, of parliament that's the head of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Climate Change and the Environment in the Maldives has also expressed his support for this. He stated that, quote, time is up for an ecocide amendment to the ICC. Um, and there, are, there is, are indications that that formal amendment can be introduced and submitted just this year. In November 2019, uh, Pope Francis uh, also expressed support for a crime against ecocide, um, calling it uh, sins against ecology and so, uh, expressing support for criminalizing what he called sins against ecology or environmental destruction. Um, so the formal amendment will likely be submitted most likely this year. Um, and you could see a lot of movement on this one, even in the past year, in terms of this maybe being something that will at least be introduced to the ICC for passage. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to mention for the international law. So we have these various types of ways you can get something in law, right? You have local laws, national laws, inter international law. The one other way that um, would be transnational law. And this is one of the ways that right now, when it comes to environmental statutes, we do have right now a lot of trans, we do have transnational statutes. So this is an international uh, treaty that a lot of countries sign that states that they all agree to criminalize something. And then those countries implement their own domestic laws. Right now that's sort of a patchwork quilt, right? But we do have, for example, the International Convention Against International Trade in Endangered Species, which a number of countries signed. And then they all implemented their own domestic laws against trading in endangered species that led in the US to the Endangered Species Act. 
So there's some um, advocacy on the thought that, well, maybe this should just be a transnational treaty that everybody signs and then implements their own domestic law, as opposed to trying to get it into the ICC, which will have a lot of, a lot of problems, honestly, to try to get that into the uh, Rome Statute. But that's really where the action, that's where the advocacy is, and that's where it really does seem like there's a good chance that this will at least be introduced. Um, and uh, if nothing else, it will cre perhaps create an impetus for other countries to create their own laws as well. Um, I think that's it. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Anastasia Green. Everyone clap at home on mute. She, she yeah, yeah. will know, <laughs> she'll sense it. Okay, great. And it's, it's always great to meet uh, more professors who are so interested in ecocentric law. Um, I didn't know Anastasia Green until uh, we emailed just recently, and, and now I'm really excited to uh, get to know your work better and see where we can where we can collaborate. I'm excited um, to talk to you all. Yeah, great. Uh, now we're going to hear from Jojo Meta, who has for years been on the front lines of the ecocide movement, and she'll speak about her experiences and uh, what is in the pipeline. And so let me introduce her a little more uh, with degrees from Oxford and London universities and a background in communication, entrepreneurship and on the ground environmental activism. Jojo Meta co-founded the UK nonprofit Ecological Defense Integrity with barrister and legal pioneer Polly Higgins in 2017 to support the establishment of Ecocide as a crime at the International Criminal Court. To crowdfund this, they launched the public facing campaign Stop Ecocide where supporters declare themselves earth protectors and contribute to a globally validated trust fund. Jojo is a key spokeswoman for the work and overall uh, coordinator of Stop Ecocide's international legal and diplomatic team and campaign team. So welcome Jojo, another muted clap. And I will pass it off uh, to her. Yeah, hi there. Hi, I, hope can, I hope you can all hear me. Yep. Hi. Um, firstly, can I just say how incredibly exciting and delightful it is to be in a forum where there's already familiarity with the concept of ecocide. Not only that, but you know, really kind of informed historical information about it. So it's quite rare that I find myself speaking in a forum where I'm not having to start from scratch. So this is this is just an absolute delight for me. So thank you so much, Herman, and thank you so much, Anastasia, for for that those incredibly informed. Uh, backgrounds um, and and actually you know my kind of ears nearly popped when um, Herman was saying there were kind of over 2,000 environmental treaties already in existence not not a number I was familiar with but I was like my god you know how, how can that be and for us still to be in this incredible position we're in globally you know being on this on this brink if you like um, and and the first my first um, kind of response to that in a way is is that you know, most of that is in the arena of civil law. Um, and, you know, while Anastasia is you know, absolutely right, there are certain countries that have uh, ecocide on their criminal, you know, in their criminal penal code. Um, it, it's, you know, the actual enforcement of that in some of those countries is, is difficult, as she's also explained. Um, and, you know, that this hasn't yet gone global. And I love the way that, you know, she was kind of describing that there's this kind of bubbling up going on, which is something that we very much feel, um, but we often find that we're trying to convey because people don't, don't, don't understand that. But it's, you know, for us, the key thing is the, you know, this one of the key things is, has always been the difference between civil and criminal law, because, um, I mean, you know, there's a lot of, for example, there's a lot of civil litigation going on worldwide. There are now well over a thousand uh, climate litigation cases going on. Um, but these, I mean, although these are very important, because obviously it, it's very important to be holding those companies to account, and it, it's very important from a PR perspective for those companies. But when it comes down to it, what they will do is they budget for them. If you change civil legislation, um, what happens is companies change their budgeting procedures. Um, whereas if you move into the criminal side of things and you're actually, because criminal law being all about individual responsibility, um, you're then effectively, you know, putting their, you know, their CEOs to not put too fine a point on it, you know, their ass is on the line, um, which is a completely different kettle of fish. Um, and, you know, is, is, is hugely powerful in comparison. So it was also really great to hear Anastasia talking about uh, what happened last year in December at the International Criminal Court. Um, uh, we've been working with Vanuatu for 
uh, that was actually the fourth uh, assembly of the International Criminal Court where we'd um, been working with Vanuatu. Um, and they really, you know, sort of took the bull by the horns last year and stood up and actually, you know, asked for serious consideration of ecocide, which was hugely exciting. Um, and to have the Maldives follow suit so, so quickly as well was, was fantastic. Um, so things I have, you know, that conversation effectively as a result of that, the whole conversation is now at international you know global state level so so that's a hugely exciting development um i think I, w I wanted to pick up on a couple of things that were said earlier as well um i mean one of the reasons that the um uh, environmental damage provision in war crimes is very difficult to meet is that the current crimes um the the four crimes that are covered by the rome statute um it all include intention um, so you have to show that somebody's intentionally created that, that damage. Um, now, we're, we're in um, discussion with a number of legal experts about developing, you know, you know, the right definition for potential proposal at the International Criminal Court. And one of the key questions, you know, considerations is actually making sure that with a crime of ecocide, um, that it doesn't actually depend on intention, because actually, you know, your average CEO is not, uh, well, we hope, is not sitting there saying, right, I'm going to completely trash the environment. They're sitting there saying, we got, I want to make some money. And en route, you know, that, that is what's happening. So the intention provision is actually very key. Um, but there is some precedent um, to using, you know, to, to effectively um, pointing to what somebody knew or should have known. Um, now, in, in UK or common law, that concept is, is called recklessness. You know, in other words, you knew this was going to happen, um, but you went ahead anyway. And that, that, that's a level, you know, there's a criminality associated with that. Now, a continental or, or Roman law doesn't have that same concept, but they do have this concept of, you know, knowledge and, you know, somebody knew or should have known. So that's, going, that's, that's quite an important factor. Um, and there's, there's also, it's also worth pointing out that there are, you know, that there are some quite key reasons why, as Anastasia was bringing up, why the ICC is important, the International Criminal Court in this, um, and potentially certainly for us in comparison to doing some, you know, to promoting this at, you know, in, in individual jurisdictions. So there are a, a few reasons for that. I mean, you know, some of them are fairly logically clear. Um, for example, I mean, a lot of the biggest polluters are actually trans transnational corporations. So unless you have something that can apply across border, um, you, do, you know, it's very hard. You know, you, what are you going to do? You're going to chase these companies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, so that's one aspect. Um, another is that is coherence. Um, so if you're, you know, I mean, I, I completely appreciate that the, there's a there's a real power to having transnational laws, but it means that you know that that obviously then varies or can vary quite strongly from state to state, and there's you know a considerable advantage in knowing that approximately the same thing is being adhered to wherever a law is ratified, which is what we would um, hope to be the case with ecocide. So so coherence is another reason. Um, for us at the moment, actually, one of the, you know, the real, the really, you know, one of the strongest um, reasons behind going for the ICC, and it may sound a bit odd to be, you know, when I first introduce it, but it's actually about political risk. Because um, France, for example, last year actually twice discussed ecocide legislation in its national parliament, um, and both times it was rejected. Um, now, you know, most, in many, if not most economies would consider it quite, quite high risk to introduce a law of ecocide um, because they would be thinking about the, their economic competitiveness um, that might be massively diminished by certain activities not being permitted. Um, and, you know, many of the, I mean, interestingly, the countries that got in the way of ecocide going into the statute in the first place, um, which the, the key ones were the UK, the US, France and Netherlands. I find it very interesting that those are oil states. Um, and some research has also shown that they, they all at the time had some kind of nuclear interests as well. So that's, that's kind of interesting. So a lot of the, especially the first world economies have very close ties with business. Um, so for them to, um, to criminalize ecocide on their own, it feels very scary. Um, and President Macron actually almost almost said this in so many words in um, 
a, it was a, a sort of climate uh, con climate convention that was in, in inviting the civil society as well in January. So this wasn't sort of necessarily publicised in the media, but it was certainly said in public. Um, what he said was that this is not something we believe should be done at the national level, but we absolutely think it should move forward at the international level. And I think that what that encapsulates is this awareness that it feels like a big political risk to do it on your own. Um, but, but by definition, if you're going to pass um, an amendment at the International Criminal Court, for it to actually get adopted into the statute requires at least two thirds of members. Now there are currently 123 members, so that would be 82 states. Um, so quite a large number of states that have to actually agree um, for it to be adopted. Now that creates a level of political safety. You know, you know, you basically know that this isn't going to go through unless this many people come with you. So, but what that also creates, and, and this is what something that we're kind of working on from a campaign perspective, is it actually creates a political opportunity as well, because it allows a, a government to potentially be seen as a leader in this arena and, you know, a leader in kind of taking this forward without necessarily putting their, you know, making themselves vulnerable economically instantly. Um, so, you know, they, they kind of, they, there's, there's a way that can be, you know, we were, you know, our, we're all about kind of how do we take the whole world with us on this? Um, and so, you know, this, that this aspect is actually very important in terms of uh, campaigning at the international level. Um, and in terms of the actual timeline that we're looking at, I mean, it would be absolutely wonderful to get a, proper, uh, a proposal this year. Um, I mean, certainly Vanuatu is a front runner. Um, however, I will say, and, and you know, with um, the greatest uh, compassion right now, they have literally just suffered the worst cyclone in some years, literally over the last few days. And, you know, there's, there's huge damage that's just been sustained by many of their, uh, you know, in, their, by their infrastructure on, on, on a percentage of their islands and it, that you know they're going to be dealing with that for the foreseeable um so you know there there are always you know aspects that can you know potentially affect you know where they're able to put their political um focus right now um however we do believe that it is fairly close the um the possibility of somebody actually proposing this um and also of course just the cut the current global situation has completely changed the sort of uh, the odds if you like of of people uh, of, of various states supporting this um because there is of course this global awareness that something must be done you know that something has to change um and and of course the current uh, pandemic that is is currently going on is is it only underlining that you know the, the, this there's, there's a kind of global awareness that you know we can't just return to destructive business as usual um and you know i mean our our whole you know our sense is that you know ecocide law has to be a key you know discussion point in term you know when we're talking about how do we you know how do we approach you know changing some of those baseline rules um in order to cope with with what is to come um so and 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 i think also it's it's worth highlighting i think um that you know the, i mean the rights of nature movement has grown hugely over the last decade um and you know it had there's there's this as, as Herman underlined very well, the uh, difference between, you know, approaching nature as a, as a, as a legal subject um, and the anthropocentric system that we have is actually comes down to separation. So it comes down to this, um, st this very deeply inculcated mindset that we have in the first world where um you know humans and nature are two separate things but also you know there's a separation not just between humans and nature but between humans and, and other humans as well and you know other 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 cultures other ways of doing things you know there's this there's this very you know the individualistic the extreme of the indiv of individualism if you like and um I mean, I would say that this, this uh, you know, actually goes back many centuries, you know, the, the, the whole kind of dualistic sense of, um, 
I mean, you know, you go back as far as Plato, you've got the kind of ideal versus the real. If you go through the, the, the period dominated by the Catholic Church, you've got the spirit versus matter. You know, you move then into the Enlightenment, you've still, you've got the, 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 the rational, the reason that's kind of idolized and the, 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 the substance of nature that is intended to be dominated. So you have this very, very strong theme, you know, running through Western culture. So, um, you know, people often say to us, you know, what's your biggest, you know, who are your biggest, you know, opponents? And, you know, it, it tends to be those who are deeply, deeply embedded in this way of thinking, which is also led, of course, to the current economic approach of, you know, treating nature as an infinite resource. Um, and so, you know, we, we end, what, what we're actually dealing with, what the way we perceive it is that, you know, ecocide law is kind of a correction of an imbalance because it's actually reflecting a reality so effectively what you're saying is if you damage nature to this extent you're damaging everything you're damaged you know it, it, it's it's actually going to affect the, the whole of humanity is going to affect um you know life on earth in general um and so and you know that that is in itself an acknowledgement that humanity is part of you know a, a a wider web of life on earth um and and that's something that so you know it's an interesting, you know, it's one of the reasons that we see it as a, as a kind of a linchpin, if you like, in terms of shifting the cultural moral baseline. Um, because what we do in the first world is we use criminal law as our moral red line. Um, you know, that's, you know, criminal law is, is kind of how we conceive of what's acceptable and not acceptable, which is one of the reasons why those thousands of treaties, uh, you know, supposedly to protect the environment, have not succeeded in preventing the harm. Now, I mean, uh, just to give a, a small example, just earlier this year, the, the CEO of Siemens, the big German company uh, was coming under some uh, you know under fire for its support of the Adani mine in Australia um, and their CEO came out and said well you know we, we we are you know we're bound by our obligations to our shareholders so your baseline obligation for a CEO is return for their shareholders um, but you know we, we we would definitely you know we would adhere to you know whatever is legal and lawful so you know, which is why he's not talking about we're trying not to kill people because it's already assumed that that is not legal and not lawful. So you can see the difference it would make to actually, you know, criminalize uh, mass damage and destruction to nature. It would actually completely change that um, that environment of, of of what companies feel obliged to do. Um, and so, you know, that that's kind of that's an aspect that re I mean for us that relates to rights of nature almost in a kind of other side of the coin way so you know rights of nature is the one side of the coin which and, and then responsibilities come with the criminal law with the other side so I mean in the same way as your your right to life is protected by the fact that it's a crime to kill you <laughs> um, you know the rights of nature can be protected by a law of ecocide um, I also thought it was interesting that, uh, what, that Anast Anastasia brought up the different types of uh, uh, damage to nature that ecocide could cover. Um, and in the in the former USSR countries, there are you know there are some specifics given about you know uh, pollution of air and pollution of water and so on. I think what is what's also important in terms of um, any draft that eventually it begins to be used is that there is also a kind of a, a sort of a wild card aspect if you like which we do find under crimes against humanity for example uh, under the rome statute they have an article um which you know they list it lists the different um potential crimes against humanity and then there's a final article that says any other inhumane act that you know that could potentially contribute to the overall crime and I think that's actually going to be really important with ecocide law as well because we don't actually know for, you know from this year to five years time what ecocidal activities will have been dreamed up um, and, and you know be, be potentially put into use so another angle if you like on this is that ecocide law is becoming it's becoming more and more evident that that a law of this kind has to come into play and it comes into play as a kind of almost a legal insurance policy for life on earth because what you're saying is you know whatever you do you cannot create this amount of damage to nature and so there's a there's a kind of natural restriction then 
as, as to what exactly is acceptable and not acceptable. So that's also going to be an important part of that. Um, and yeah, well, I mean, right, right now to sort of bring it sort of bang up to date, I guess, um, the, you know, we have, we have a situation where we have an NGO, um, which again was, was, was talked about by Anastasia that was started by myself and Polly Higgins. Um, and we are, a, a as far as we know, we're the, we're the only um, NGO that concentrates specifically on making ecocide an international crime. Um, and we're working directly with, with lawyers, with diplomats, um, you know, with, um, with researchers at the, at the diplomatic level. We're, we're effectively an advocacy group that, that that's what we do we're, we're sort of lobbyists if you like i mean i guess we like to think of ourselves as the sort of the good twin of you know the fossil fuel lobbyists it, it, it's 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 an it's essentially it's an advocacy game um and that's what we focus on but we also have this public facing campaign stop ecocide to support that um because you know the, the way that we're, we're sort of approaching it is, you know, why should we always leave it to the corporates to, you know, to do the lobbying and to, you know, advocate for the laws that ultimately their industry would like to see in place? Because that's actually what we see happen generally. You know, isn't it time that, you know, we the people actually advocated and, you know, did the same job, but for a law that, you know, we all want and that the earth desperately needs? Um, so that, that's, that kind of explains, if you like, our, our, our kind of setup. Um, and what we're also aware of, I mean, and, and this tends to come out <laughs> whenever I speak, I mean, I come from an activist background um, and, you know, there's always this element of, of kind of, you know, come on board, you know, have a look at what we're doing and come on board because, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to sort of spread this much more broadly and it's just starting to gain the kind of traction where people are starting to use the word ecocide in everyday in everyday discourse i wouldn't say we're quite so far as to say it's a household word yet but it's it's definitely heading in that direction um and that's been and that's been i think in large part to do with the civil mobilizations that we've seen over the last year so greta thunberg and the fridays for future the youth climate strikers um, but also to Extinction Rebellion, who really took up ecocide as a key, as a key um, word and concept, and and so you know we've we've seen you know major you know heads of state um, you know members of the royal family you know the very visible people starting to use this term. So a lot of this is about expanding that conversation, so that governments are aware that at a civil level this is something people understand. And, and you know, want to move towards, um, and uh, also as, uh, as Anastasia pointed out, you know this this is something that's that is now really starting to bubble. It's something that we genuinely consider to be inevitable. Um, what we consider ourselves to be doing is kind of, uh, you know, essentially trying to accelerate the point that this actually goes into international law, um, just so that we don't end up at the point where you know we've. <laughs> killed off half of life on earth before somebody goes well actually my gosh we have to have this kind of law um you know we know that w this is going to be inevitable at some point um and i think the, the final thing that i wanted to bring out you know before we you know go, go for questions um and so on which is obviously very welcome um is <laughs> is, is that you know this <laughs> there's something about um this concept of ecocide law that is going to it, 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 there's a there's a change that it can bring about in our framework there's something that is um it's kind of very you know it's very fundamental you know it's it's not tinkering about with one issue or one other issue you know another issue it's actually shifting the whole framework to enable us to actually visualize a more beautiful world you know a world that we that, that you know we actually want to be living in you know I, I mean i would you know bet my bottom dollar that there's an awful lot of people out there right now who are saying god you know we i don't want to return to business as usual um and so you know we do see we you know we see ecocide law as a, a very um yeah a, a kind of a framing piece really in in that move towards you know a more livable world um so yeah um i think that's probably the best place to leave it for now and thanks for listening and obviously very welcome to ask questions okay muted clap everybody for jojo meta thank you um jojo you had a youtube video do you still want me to play that 
I mean, it'd be great if you'd like to. I mean, we just, we literally just made this last week in response to the global situation. And yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd love to share that. It's just a couple of minutes long. So yeah, if you're up so for doing that. Call this the world premiere. Is that fair? Or no? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, hold on. Well, yeah, no, it's, it's, just, it's just hitting social media this week. So. Ooh, okay, the, the world premiere at an, on a major international stage. Hold on. <laughs> Can you imagine campaigning for human rights or social justice if mass murder and torture were legally permitted? It would be pretty difficult, right? If you're campaigning for environmental justice, climate justice, or the rights of nature, or if you're working in conservation at any level, this is exactly the problem you have. Because serious harm to nature is permitted. Destroying ecosystems right now is not a crime. At the time of recording this, during the COVID-19 pandemic, many polluting activities are on pause. But as the UN's environment chief has pointed out, nature has issued a warning. Pandemics could become more frequent if we return to destructive business as usual, because commercial exploitation and destruction of natural habitats and ecosystems upsets nature's balance. Indeed, the climate and ecological crisis already unfolding is the direct result of such disturbance and damage sustained over decades. It is therefore imperative that we seize this moment to adjust our baseline rules, our laws, to temper corporate behaviour towards nature, in order to preserve and nurture life. There is no baseline rule that prohibits serious harm to nature, harm that has brought us to the brink we now stand on. There's a key piece of the jigsaw that is missing. A crime that is happening all around us and described in many different ways, but which has yet to be clearly named, even by many who confront it regularly. That crime is ecocide. Just imagine how much easier it would be to protect what we love and what supports life. From honeybees to chimpanzees, from rivers to rainforests, from fertile soil to living oceans, from food resilience to land stewardship, if it were a crime to destroy ecosystems. It would make all the difference. Even just using the term ecocide makes a difference. It highlights the agency that humans and especially corporations have. We are suffering a biodiversity crisis and ultimately a climate crisis because ecocide has been committed over decades. It should be a crime. And that's what we campaign for. Making ecocide an international crime. That's it. That's what we do. Ours is the only global campaign dedicated specifically to that. Most people don't even know it's possible, let alone that we're part way there. We're already working with international criminal lawyers to take this forward. We're already working with vulnerable states which are starting to call for it on the global stage. And when we succeed, everybody wins. Every campaign for every threatened species, every indigenous group fighting for ancestral lands and forests, every country struggling with toxic extractive industry, every ordinary human being wanting to leave a livable earth to their children, it all gets easier. It all starts to become possible. Making ecocide a crime really can change everything. So consider supporting our work as part of what you do. Ecocide law is an essential offering to the discussion of how we avoid returning to destructive business as usual as and when this pandemic is over. This is no longer just an idea whose time has come. It's the key missing piece to create a livable world. Join our public campaign at stopecocide.earth and sign up as an earth protector to help fund this vital work. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. So thank you and thank you. New Jersey, Oops. Michigan, California, Louisiana. Hold on. Uh, in terms of how we're Hi, can you hear me? Hopefully so. Sorry, YouTube playlist yep. took over. Okay, we're back. Um, great, so thank you for the video. Uh, <laughs> I will uh, conclude here. Uh, so we learned all about ecocide and ecocentric law from uh, three great speakers. 
And I wanted to conclude by making a few connections between ecocide and the rights of nature. Uh, but I think Jojo Meta and, and the green team, Herman and Anastasia, as I now call them, uh, they're both greens, uh, already made very strong connections between these movements. So I won't go uh, too much into depth, but I will note a, a few connections, uh, most of which we've, we've already heard. Uh, first, I love what Jojo was talking about. Putting, uh, putting ecocentric law into practice requires both rights and responsibilities. Rights of nature can represent the rights and making ecocide a crime, uh, the, the responsibilities are, are part thereof. Uh, another connection, broadly speaking, both ecocide and rights of nature seek justice for nature. Uh, this is key. Uh, both ecocide and rights of nature clearly embrace the concept that we must not treat nature as mere human property, as this worldview has led to the destruction and exploitation of much of our planet. Uh, both ecocide and rights of nature also recognize that humans are part of nature and destroying ecosystem impacts all life, including human life. And I also think it's important to note that ecocide, uh, recognizing ecocide as a crime, would strengthen the rights of nature and vice versa. Um, ecocide would strengthen the rights of nature by creating a clear cause of action against the largest culprits of massive environmental harms, particularly the government. And rights of nature strengthens ecocide by giving nature rights to be heard in a court and perhaps to enforce uh, its own rights in an ecocide course, court uh, case, rather than uh, such a case coming only from a human perspective. Uh, both ecocide and rights of nature are part of a new generation of emerging ecocentric legal movements that seek to protect, stabilize, and restore Earth's life and life support systems. Uh, Herman talked about this at, at the beginning. And this brings me uh, to my last point, uh, we can incorporate ecocentric law into so many legal and social movements. Uh, ecocide incorporates ecocentrism into criminal law reform. And rights of nature incorporates ecocentrism into fundamental rights reform. And so I encourage everyone to ask themselves, how can you incorporate ecocentrism into your own work? And you can be creative. Just to give you a little example, I recently formed a partnership to advance ecocentrism within IP law by filing patent applications on behalf of nature for inventions made using biomimicry. And some of the, the, the royalties from these inventions would go to a trust fund to be spent on behalf of nature. So, you know, who knew that IP law could uh, be a part of uh, ecocentric law, but it really can. Um, if you do corporate law, maybe you can advise corporations, uh, large and small, about how to incorporate uh, ecocentrism into their mission, such as by amending their bylaws to respect the integral health of the planet. Uh, outside of the law, maybe you can review sustainability practices at your workplace to harmonize them with the needs of nature. Uh, if you're an educator, you can teach these concepts in your classes, and it sounds like a lot of people here already do that. Um, we recently had a high school intern uh, a couple years ago and um, I swear to God, this guy is going to be uh, president of the United States of America one day. And I caught up with him after a couple of years and said, you know, hey, when are you going to be president? You know, you're getting, you're getting closer to the age. And uh, when you do, can you make a rights of nature task force? And he looks at me and says, Grant, I'm going to make a rights of nature department. I'm like, yes. So, you know, education really is key because that's part of education there, empowering the next generation of environmental leaders. Um, and there's so many other things you can do. If you don't have an idea, contact someone who might, like the great speakers here today. And um, of course, uh, keep fighting both for recognizing ecocide as a crime, uh, for the rights of nature, and all of the other uh, amazing ecocentric legal movements that are out there, which uh, we call Earth Law, but go by many names. And um, I'm confident we will be successful. Okay, so that, that's my conclusion. Uh, we're gonna get to the Q&A in just a minute, but I want everyone to mark their calendars for uh, the next webinar in this series. It's just in two weeks from today on April 21st, 11 a.m. Uh, the topic is law at the intersection of human rights and the environment. And it has an absolutely amazing lineup, uh, including both the current and previous special repertoire on human rights and the environment and several leading experts in this field, so don't miss it. Uh, the information is on the uh, Ecological Law and Governance Association website. Uh, and also, if you enjoyed uh, this webinar from your friends at Earth Law Center, that's us, uh, we're hosting another one uh, in collaboration with the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. That one will be held September 17th, 2020. So no excuses, this is plenty of advance notice. And the topic will be Ecological Law and Governance, the Role of the Sacred. 
Uh, the exact time is still being determined. Uh, finally, please go uh, visit the Facebook and social media pages of Earth Law Center and, and Stop Ecocide uh, on Facebook. Uh, also check out Anastasia Green's recent law review article on Ecocide, which is excellent. And you'll uh, be able to keep up to date about all the interesting topics you heard about today. Uh, so with that, we will uh, go to the, the Q&A here. Uh, I've got a couple highlighted that people asked earlier, and, and then we'll just open it up uh, to anyone who wants to ask questions. Uh, I think you're welcome to just speak up so long as you're not Zoom bombing us. No Zoom bombers, welcome. Uh, so here's a question. Uh, would ecocide laws require a showing of economic harm? Uh, and then uh, do those ecocide laws only apply in wartime con uh, conditions? And if, if someone already responded to these in the chats, I apologize. So anyone who wants to answer that question. Um, I would I would say that I mean well the the current provision in international law covers wartime only and intentional only um, a, a standalone crime of ecocide as part of the Rome statute would cover peacetime as well so that's that's the answer to that one um, with the economic harm no I would say not um, because w the, I think it's it's actually very important to not have ecocide law dependent upon anything economic um, and actually I mean I'd, I'd, I'd kind of make that into a wider point and say that you know the bigger human freedoms that have been won you know over the last 150 years i mean if we look at abolition of slavery we look at suffragettes the civil rights movement those have always been ultimately moral developments not economic developments um and i think as soon as you start bringing economics into the arena um things start getting very murky indeed so i would i would suggest that that, that absolutely not it would not um, depend upon an economic harm being done not if we have anything to do with it. <laughs> I just want to thank you for that because it's the difference between the criminal um, criminalization for ecocide and the tort because my, my brain immediately went to tort and you have to prove harm and, and how much resistance and how difficult is that to get over that as a tort and really make it into a crime. And that, that, was, a, that was very enlightening. Thank you. Great, thanks. The next question we have is, if there are so many ecocentric laws in South America, uh, why are environmental activists in South America being murdered? Are they not protected by their governments? And uh, I'll recall that every two days or so, an environmental defender uh, in the world is murdered. And uh, check out the Global Witness reports on this topic, as well as Earth Law Center's reports on co-violations of human rights and environmental rights. Um, but if anyone would like to address that question. I don't know if I'm the best person to address this question, but a lot of times what you can see is a real tension. Um, it's a societal, it's a socioeconomic tension. In many respects, it's also a racial tension. So you can see a lot of the activism that's being done is amongst, for example, indigenous groups, right? Uh, Native American groups. And in a lot of the countries of, of Latin America, it is actually very racially stratified. It is so a lot of, you see a real tension between sort of like the upper, upper class um, and then for indigenous people or lower class, working class. And one of the issues that happens if you look at a lot of these activists, many of them are coming from that group, you know, from indigenous groups or environmental groups. And then they're being essentially persecuted or oppressed by this higher, you know, higher hierarchy of the upper class. Um, and, I, and there is the, the issue of corruption. And I think a lot of it does also stem from just the economic stratification in terms of just being a very, you know, an elite ruling class that's like the top 1%, right? And then you have the, the people below that don't have necessarily that power. So yeah, but there is a lot of activism being done. It's true. And there's, there's been a lot of progress in the laws too, but they're still fighting against this, uh, this overarching sort of uh, economic structure that's been placed on them. Um, and to the extent that that can change, I think that you can potentially see a world explosion of environmental law in, in Latin America. I just I would just add to that that I mean obviously some governments are clearly totally unsympathetic to environmental concerns. I mean Bolsonaro is the obvious 
example of that. Um, but even in countries like, for example, Ecuador, that have strong uh, protections for nature in their constitutions, um, there's, there are still, well, firstly, there are issues, of, there are some issues of, you know, potentially corruption in government. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of, in a sense, um, lip service being given to indigenous rights and to nature's rights, but in practice, that not actually being carried out. And secondly, they're also very hamstrung by national debt. Um, and, you know, they, they, they can then end up kind of in hock to, you know, other countries or big oil interests, even though potentially their, you know, their law, the constitution says that, that, you know, they should behave, be behaving in one way, their economic concerns are forcing them to, to, you know, act, act in other ways. So it's, you know, it's, it can be quite complex, um, a co quite a complex situation. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question I have is, um, let's see here. It disappeared. Oh, okay. Uh, how could the treaty for uh, the prohibition of nuclear weapons be related to ecocide? I'm happy to have, you know, say something on that. I, I wouldn't um, be able to give you a detail on exactly how that could be integrated, but I think that it's um, unsurprising perhaps that um, concerns around nuclear may have led to the dropping of um, the the article on ecocide from the Rome Statute, because it's actually quite difficult to imagine how um, you could reconcile, reconcile even the existence of nuclear weapons alongside a law of ecocide. Because by definition, a nuclear weapon is going to create ecocide. So you know, so that there, there is, you know, there's potentially, you know, some, you know, there's some definite potential cross, well, cross referencing to be done there. Yeah. There's also the issue when it comes to nuclear testing as well, um, where even when they were really uh, talking about the lobby side of the ICC, they talked about the fact that maybe countries are now committing ecocide. Like if they tried to make this a law, a lot of these countries would now be subject to it. A lot of countries at the time were still doing above ground nuclear testing, um, which would now probably be, you know, it would be considered an ecocide. And so that was the one connection there as well in terms of like the use of nuclear weapons or the testing of nuclear weapons would be, pretty much be like a de facto example of an ecocide. Um, and so there's a real connection there that can be made, I think, in terms of the existing treaty for nuclear weapons and connecting that to a law of ecocide as well. Um, I'd like to add to that, actually, that one of the um one of the issues with bringing in a new criminal law is obviously once the law is in place, it's applicable, but but not before that. So the criminal law is not normally applicable retrospectively. Um, and so one of the important aspects um, from our perspective of bringing in a law of ecocide is that people need to see it coming. Um, and so, you know, and, and that happens again, kind of naturally, in a sense, with the with the procedures that are required at the International Criminal Court. So it's a kind of a four stage process for adoption of um, an amendment. You know, a state has to propose it. Um, three months then have to pass for, you know, the members to be notified of that proposal. Um, the second stage is admissibility, which is at the next sort of major meeting, which is, these are usually the December assemblies um, of the ICC, uh, a, a, a simple majority of those present has to basically agree that, yes, we're happy to have this on the table for discussion. That's not actually adoption at that stage. It's just a kind of, yes, we'll talk about this. Um, the third stage requires two thirds support, and that would be uh, adopt, you know, th at that point, you know, whatever's been thrashed out by that point between the interested parties um, and, and it would, you would be adopted into the statute. And then the fourth stage is ratification where states actually ratify that new amendment. But the, at the stage of proposal, or even we're even beginning to see it now, I would say, with that kind of bubbling that Anastasia was talking about and the fact that it's been called for on the international stage, what you already start to get is when that's visible on the horizon, it, you know, because that procedure would take, I mean, at its shortest, would probably take about three years um, with crimes of aggression, amending that took actually seven years. Um, what you're creating is this period where people can see it coming. So just to give a simple parallel, um, you know, last year when the um, data protection regulations came in in Europe, I don't know if that was the same thing in the US, um, you know, people knew that by a certain date, 
every company was going to have to be compliant with these data regulations. It gives this kind of impetus for people to start changing the direction of where they're putting their focus. So even now we're starting to see a difference in, you know, going right back to the beginning of the production chain. So you're looking at bankers, financiers, insurers, reinsurers, you know, really starting to think twice about what they're insuring and what they're financing because they can see that the writing is on the wall and as soon as you have a state propose it even though the other steps haven't been gone through yet you're looking at a whole kind of um starting to you know a shift in this you know a real really strong steer in the direction for for economic activity so that by the time i mean you know in our ideal world by the time ecocide law actually hits the statute books you don't want to be prosecuting loads of people. What you want to have happened is for people to have really seen that coming and gone, right, okay, we, we need to do things a different way, um, you know, collectively uh, it, it, on a really big scale. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question I have is, uh, what are some recommended resources for uh, drafting the elements of Ecoside? And the, uh, the commenter notes that the U.S. Federal District Court recently violated the Lake Erie Bill of Rights on void for vagueness grounds. So the time is ripe for spelling out the details. Um, so Polly Higgins, uh, you know, her organization and Ecoside on Earth, they, they have created a model law, it's the uh, British for the UK, that could be implemented and that could be a good template to use. Um, but definitely it is the major problem with vagueness. Um, that was the problem as well with France. Uh, part of what they pointed out when that, when that was not uh, passed was that it was too vague. Um, I'm part of a task force now as like a faculty of, of um, you know, law professors is about trying to draft a sufficiently detailed, sufficiently non-vague uh, ecocide provision. But it has been always a problem with ecocide. Um, there's, there's the thought there that ecocide doesn't have a ready definition and because it's not like something where you have um, homicide or something like that where there's a pretty ready definition of it. Ecocide, there's different definitions of it. Some of them are vague. Some require intent, some don't. You know, some will be based on damage to people only, some are da damage to the earth only. And, you know, it, there is a need there to have a standardized definition, I think, of the term. I think Anastasia is absolutely right. And, and actually, you know, we, ha we had a, 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 a sort of one day symposium in The Hague last year, sort of running concurrently with the, um, the International Criminal Court Assembly, where there was a number of, you know, heads of NGOs and lawyers and diplomats there. And we were, you know, discussing exactly this. Um, and, you know, we have, we're working with experts at the moment to potentially, you know, pull together a draft that actually is, is acceptable to states that are interested in taking it forward. Um, and that is precise enough to um for, for it to work um and yet broad enough for it to be effective um and that you know that there is you know there is a constant you know so there is a kind of a balance to be struck there um and of course the other thing is that um and and you, you're right um uh, in, uh, polly did draft a, a uk uh, example of an ecocide act that was put into practice that was tested at the in a mock trial in 2011 and shown to be you know usable um but in, at the international level, the definition that she gave in 2010 to the, um, to the International Law Commission, which is the definition that Anastasia read out earlier, is actually really great as a campaign definition. I mean, it, it, it was good enough for the Pope, who pretty much used it word for word last November. So, yeah, that shows it's, you know, it's, it's got credibility. However, when you line it up with the other crimes in the Rome Statute, it isn't, you know, it doesn't quite fit. Um, and certain aspects, certain elements of it, um, you know, work in common law, but not in continental law and so on. So there, there, there is some refinement that, that is needed to, to, to end up with a, a definition that, that, is, that is workable. But it's also worth bearing in mind that at this stage, this is, you know, it's a question of what is workable for a state to propose it, because once you get to the stage of um, discussion and adoption, that will inevitably get, um, you know, mutated, discussed, all of that, all of that will happen. Um, but I don't think that changes at all the power of having it proposed in the way that I was, I was just describing earlier in terms of where that, you know, the writing that that puts on the wall. Great, thank you. Uh, now I have a rights to nature question. Someone asked, what is the relevance of the rights of the Wanganui River in New Zealand in the discussion of rights of nature? And um, that's something I know about. I'm happy to speak on, or if someone else wants to, feel free. I think you should speak on that. 
Sure. So, um, in 2017, the Wanganui River and a treaty agreement between the Wanganui Iwi, uh, which is an indigenous Maori tribe and the, the Crown Government of New Zealand, recognized that uh, this river is a, a living entity uh, with uh, personhood rights. And um, now, this is what many rights of nature people would call giving rights to nature. Um, but also it shouldn't be squarely classified as, as that because really it's an indigenous rights movement. It's a reflection of Maori culture and belief systems. And um, it's, you know, inaccurate and unfair to um, those belief systems and, you know, the actual treaty process that happened to uh, squarely call it uh, rights of nature uh, as part of this larger movement that can sometimes lose its individual identity. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, this precedent has inspired countless other uh, legal victories, including those recognizing rights of ecosystems, uh, just shortly after uh, this treaty agreement recognized the rights of the Wanganui River, uh, a court in New Zealand, or sorry, a court in India cited the New Zealand treaty agreement in ruling that uh, two rivers in, uh, in India had inherent rights. So here's a court, you know, in a totally different country, citing this uh, um, incredible treaty agreement as support for making a, a landmark ecocentric rights of nature legal decision. Um, now that decision was uh, later stayed by India's Supreme Court, but I think it's still relevant. Um, we're working with uh, uh, tribes in the US and First Nations in Canada that um, are working to uh, pass laws recognizing the rights of specific ecosystems like rivers and um, they'll want to hear from the people in, in New Zealand who recognize the rights of the Wanganui River uh, to uh, learn about their experiences and find inspiration uh, within their own cultural context to do something similar. Uh, so really it's been, you know, one of the, if not the biggest uh, instances of a successful uh, uh, rights of nature uh, paradigm being put into practice. Uh, but again, I, you know, you, you have to look at it in its individual context um, as a representation of a, a particular people's and culture um, when observing it. But yeah, it's been very influential. Uh, so the next question I have here is um, about population growth. Uh, it's a huge destructive force. How do you stop this? Even if we prosecuted corporate bad, bad actors, we still have a growing population demanding resources. And so um, I guess the question to uh, the panelists is, know, how can ecocide or rights of nature or other ecocentric laws uh, fare against population growth? Well, one answer is that, um, <clears throat> that the impact of the top 1% of the world um, is far, far, far more than the entire 10% of, the, uh, of the, uh, the poorest people of the world. In fact, uh, I did some calculations based on uh, an idea that, uh, you know, the top 1% has an environmental impact 150 times the bottom 10%. So it would take like 280 billion, I mean, 150 billion people living like the bottom 10% to equal the impact of the top 1%. So I think that's the first thing is that, uh, that uh, really the, uh, environmental crisis is a problem of wealth, not of poverty, and problem of wealth and industrial development, not primarily of population. But uh, the issue of population uh, will be, have to be addressed in the long term as people become better educated and, um, and um, you know, greater awareness of uh, education of women and other things like this. Great, thank you, Herman. Okay, so I'll move on to the, the next question here. Uh, this is from a student and they say, uh, what can I do to best support ecocide law as an 18 year old student? Great question. Question of the day award. So any, any answers there? Um, well, I'm sure you all have your own ideas as well, but um, I think a lot of it can be just raising awareness, um, you know, with your friends or with the advocacy that you do. Uh, if you're part of like a model UN or something like that, if you're uh, debating, 
any sort of like uh, moot, what do they call debate team things, if you can have that as a subject, I think it's a very, very interesting topic for a high school student to do. So for Mata UN, what, what would you do with the law of ecocide if you're going to be debating? Should it be, should it be criminalized? Something that would just sort of have this on people's radar. Um, you could be involved as well in a local level. I go back and forth on this. Like, is the best way to do this go top down from the ICC or bottom up? There's, there's an argument the best way may be bottom up in terms of like individual people on the ground in their own town, creating an ordinance, going door to door, talking about we should pass this, talking about protecting a certain natural resource even in your area. And, and all of that helps to raise awareness. And it all, it all builds up, it all bubbles up, I think. I would say absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's a yeah, pincer movement here. <laughs> it's top down and bottom up. And and you know, of course, the first thing I would say is get you know join our campaign and get all your friends to do so, um, because the more visibility and numbers that we have, the more persuasive that is on governments, and the safer those small states will feel when they want to stand up and say this is this is what we're calling for, because they are then able to say, look at this you know, look at this movement that's actually behind this, you know, look at, look at the support that's there. So I would absolutely say, you know, make that your first move. Um, and, and of course, you know, I agree also with all the, the things Anastasia is suggesting. Um, and, and, you know, anything that kind of brings, I mean, it's also just bringing the word into the discourse, you know, this, 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 this sense of, you know, mass destruction of nature, you know, just bringing that scale sense into things as well, just really, really, really helps just to enlarge that conversation. Okay, great. Um, well, I think we're out of questions here. Uh, just quickly, I wanted to note from uh, Lindsay put a comment about population growth and uh, check out sightline.org, something called misplaced blame that uh, analyzes how to how taking care of people can address population growth. Uh, <laughs> so check that out. Um, any other lingering questions, or should we call this call this a wrap? Okay, well, that's it. Well, thank you so much to our three amazing speakers. Again, a uproarious applause that no one will ever hear, but uh, is on is muted on Zoom. Uh, very privileged that all three of you were able to join, uh, in, in, including uh, relatively uh, last minute due to my uh, poor planning. Uh, so thank you all for joining. Uh, please follow up with all of these amazing speakers and their organizations, and uh, be sure to incorporate this as the last question got to into your own work, get involved, uh, sign up and uh, just begin talking about these things uh, with your friends, families, and colleagues. So thanks everyone. Hope to see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. -bye.